Hi guys. Well, in the last hour, it has gone from a spectacularly gorgeous 75 degree bright sunny day to a gloomy rainy night. You're in the collapse of global industrial civilization in the drought plagued wasteland of the Finger Lakes of New York. Here on this now gloomy <clears throat> Thursday night, October 15th, 2020. So uh, I have been spending this gorgeous day out moving my blueberry bushes out of the way of the salt, the road salt, and cleaning out my garage from hell, getting ready to head south for the winter. So I'm just now getting around to figuring out today's chronicle of the collapse, which is a no-brainer since a couple of you have sent this to me. From the good old Guardian, you know, guys, uh, I, I feel like I've just become a, a mouthpiece for the Guardian, but you know, and, and good for the Guardian. I mean, all kidding aside, I know Andy the Gardener gives, uh, d doesn't think the Guardian is that great, but compared to uh, what we have over in this country, but we're actually going to go down to Australia for this essay by this climatologist named Joel. Gurgis. What is Joel's resume? Dr. Joel Gurgis is an award-winning climate scientist and writer based at the Australian National University. She's the lead author, huh? She is the lead author of the United Nations IPCC Sixth Assessment Report and an expert advisor to the Climate Council uh, the author of the book, Sunburnt Country, the History and Future of Climate Change in Australia. So, uh, you know, we're always hearing about how these IPCC climatologists are way too conservative. So let's hear what the lead author of the sixth assessment sounds like when she's given a little more free reign, take it away. Uh, Joel, Dr. Joel Gurgis, in her essay, The Great Unraveling, I never thought I would live to see the horror of planetary collapse, but she is seeing it with her own eyes. Guys, this is a very long uh, essay, but it is, it, it is one of the most straightforward, unambiguous chronicles of the collapse written by a United Nations uh, climate scientist. Uh, I'm going to put the link on here and invite you to read this yourself, but if you just want to sit around and listen to me, drone on and on about the collapse of this planet. I'll be happy to do that for you. So uh, wind me up and watch me go. Take it away, well, Joel Gerges. <clears throat> if you've ever been around someone who is dying, it may have struck you how strong a person's life force really is. When my dad was gravely ill, an invisible point of no return was gradually crossed. Then suddenly, death was in plain sight. We stood back helplessly, knowing that nothing more could be done, that something vital had slipped away. All we could do is watch as life extinguished itself in agonizing fits and starts. What is that out there? Anyway, I don't know what's going on in my front yard. What is going on out there, little dog? As a climate scientist watching the most destructive bushfires in Australian history unfold, I felt the same stomach-turning recognition of witnessing an irreversible loss the relentless heat and drought experienced during our nation's hottest and driest year on record, you know, which was last year, saw the last of our native forests 
go up in smoke. We saw terrifying animals fleeing with their fur on fire, their bodies turned to ash. Those that survived faced starvation among the charred remains of their obliterated habitats. Yes. During Australia's black summer, you know, about six months ago, more than three billion animals were incinerated or displaced. Our beloved bushland burnt to the ground. Our collective places of recharge and contemplation changed in ways that we can barely comprehend. The koala Australia's most emblematic species now faces extinction in New South Wales by as early as 2050. Recovering the diversity and complexity of Australia's unique ecosystems now lies beyond the scale of human lifetimes. What we witnessed was intergenerational damage a fundamental transformation of our country. Then, just as the last of the bushfires went out, record-breaking ocean temperatures triggered the third mass bleaching event recorded on the Great Barrier Reef since 2016. This time, the Southern Reef, spared during the 2016 and 2017 events, finally succumbed to extreme heat. The largest living organism on the planet is dying. As one of the dozen or so Australian lead authors involved in consolidating the physical science basis for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report, I have gained terrifying insight into the true state of the climate crisis and what lies ahead. Are you paying attention, Book Hermit? I can't wait to hear Book Hermit. Just uh, Book Hermit, just, just, you know, Listen to this uh, climatologist and give your usual little uh, snarky answer that you know more about it than the climatologists do. Anyway, <clears throat> there is so much heat already baked into our climate system that a certain level of destruction is now inevitable. What concerns me is that we may, we may have already pushed the planetary system past the point of no return, that we have unleashed a cascade of irreversible changes that have built such momentum that we can only watch as it unfolds. That is what we do here on Collapse Chronicles. We watch and we <clears throat> chronicle. Australia's horror summer is the clearest signal yet that our planet's climate is rapidly destabilizing. It breaks my heart to watch the country I love irrevocably wounded because of our government's denial of the severity of climate change and its refusal to act on the advice of the world's leading scientists. And I am going to break in right here, guys, for my broken record amplification and clarification. I understand. I am not a clueless moron. I understand that the United Nations is the single biggest collection of planet eaters ever assembled uh, in one body. The United Nations is a direct threat to this planet, but I also have enough discernment and critical thinking abilities to differentiate between the scientists 
that advise the policy makers in the United Nations and the policy makers themselves. It is like the, the, the difference between the scientists such as this woman telling th these clueless morons uh, how doomed we are and their response to it is the difference between Sancho Panza and a pit bull. The science is sound. If anything, the, the science uh, is too conservative. But of course, the joke is anybody with a brain knows that, that the scientific reports are being completely ignored. They come on here and they're going to give their little lip service, their little greenwashing lip service, uh, whether it's uh, climate change, biodiversity, sustainable development, uh, whatever. Uh, they're they're going to come out of here and, and give this line of crap uh, acting like uh, they give one damn about what this woman is telling them. Do you understand the difference? I wish people would stop insulting my intelligence. I'm really getting tired of it. The, the, these clueless morons down here in the Doomosphere commenting on this channel that Sam, do you understand that, you know, guys, you embarrass me. Anybody not having the discernment and critical thinking uh, ability to understand the difference between the, the science behind the, the, these UN reports and the response to it. Anyway, uh, I had to get that off my chest. Get back to Giselle. <clears throat> I mourn all the unique animals, plants, and landscapes that are forever altered by, altered by the events of our black summer, that the earth as we know it will soon no longer exist. I grieve for the generations, plural, I grieve for the generations of children who will only ever experience the Great Barrier Reef or our ancient rainforest through photographs or David Attenborough documentaries. <laughs> In the future, his films will be like watching grainy eye-carval footage of the Tasmanian tiger, images of a lost world. As we live through this growing instability, it is becoming harder to maintain a sense of professional detachment <clears throat> from the work that I do. Given that humanity is facing an existential threat of planetary proportions, surely it is rational to react with despair anger, grief, and frustration. To fail to emotionally respond to a level of destruction that will be felt throughout the ages feels like sociopathic disregard for all life on Earth, which is exactly what it is. Uh, you know, by the UN policymakers. That that is exactly what uh, these planet eaters reading these uh, reports from from this woman uh, are. It's a sociopathic disregard for all life on Earth. I, I cannot think of a better description of the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the usual list of suspects. <clears throat> to confront this monumental reality and then continue on as usual would be like buying into a collective delusion that life as we know it will go on indefinitely. Hmm. 
regardless of what we do. The truth is, everything in life has its breaking point. My fear is that our planet's equilibrium has been lost. We are now watching on as the dominoes begin to cascade. With just 1.1 C of warming, with just 1.1 C of warming, Australia has already experienced unimaginable levels of destruction of its marine and land ecosystems in the space of a single summer. More than 20% of our country's forest burned in a single bushfire season. Virtually the entire range of the Great Barrier Reef cooked by one mass bleaching event. But what really worries me is what our black summer signals about the conditions that are yet to come. Huh. As things stand, the latest research shows that Australia could warm up to 7 degrees Celsius, 7 degrees C, above pre-industrial levels by the end of this century. If we continue along our current path, climate models show an average warming of 4.5 C with a range of 2.7 to 6.2 C by 2100. This represents a ruinous overshooting of the Paris Agreement targets, which aim to stabilize global warming at well below 2 degrees C to avoid what the UN terms dangerous levels of climate change. Yes. The revised warming projections, you know, in, the, in this newest assessment, I guess she's referring to, the revised <coughs> warming projections for Australia will render large parts of our country uninhabitable and the Australian way of life unlivable as extreme heat and increasingly erratic rainfall establishes itself as the new normal. Researchers who conducted an analysis of the conditions experienced during our black summer concluded under a scenario where emissions continue to grow, such a year would be average by 2040 and exceptionally cool by 2060. Yes. It is the type of statement that should jolt our nation's leaders out of their delusional complacency. Soon we will be facing 50 degree C summer temperatures in our southern capital cities, longer and hotter bushfire seasons, and more punishing droughts. We will be increasingly forced to shelter in our homes as dangerous heat and oppressive smoke become regular features of the Australian summer. Looking back from this future, the corona panic lockdowns of 2020 will feel like a luxury holiday. You thought she was going to say bad hair day. Thank you. Instead of a bad hair day, we have uh, what's coming down the pike will make what's going on in 2020 seem like not a bad hair day, but a luxury holiday. Thank you, UN climatologist. <clears throat> Australia's black summer was a terrifying preview of a future that no longer feels impossibly far away. We have experienced 
firsthand how unprecedented extremes can play out more abruptly and ferociously than anyone thought possible. Climate disruption is now a part of the experience of every Australian. We are being forced to come to terms with the fact that we are the generation that is likely to witness the destruction of our Earth. One more time, we are being forced to come to terms with the fact that we are the generation that is likely to witness the destruction of our Earth. We have arrived at a point in human history that I think of as the great unraveling. I never thought I would leave, live to see the horror of planetary collapse unfolding. As an Australian on the front line of the climate crisis, all I can do is try to help people make sense of what the scientific community is observing in real time. I use my writing to send out distress beacons to the wider world hoping that processing the enormity of our loss through an international lens will help us feel the sting of it. Perhaps then we will finally acknowledge the terribly sad reality that we are losing the battle to protect one of the most extraordinary parts of our planet. I often despair that everything the scientific community is trying to do to help divert, to avert disaster is falling on deaf ears. Huh. Instead, we hear the federal government announcing policies ensuring the protection of fossil fuel industries, justifying pathetic emission targets that will doom Australia to an apocalyptic nightmare of a future. Yes, the national conversation we urgently need to have following our Black Summer never happened. Our collective trauma was sidelined as a deadly pandemic took hold. Instead of grieving our losses and agreeing on how to implement an urgent plan to safeguard our nation's future, we became preoccupied whether we had enough food in the pantry, whether our job or relationship would be intact on the other side of the lockdown. Yes. When our personal safety is threatened, our capacity to handle the larger existential threat of climate change evaporates. But just because we cannot face something doesn't mean it disappears. Little dog, I know this is a long rant, but it's a good one. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm plowing on through this one. And guys, I, as Sancho Panza is letting me know, I, I still have a long way to go. I should have fed the dog uh, before I got into this, but this woman is on a roll chronicling the collapse of a planet. As many trauma survivors will tell you, it is often lack of an adequate response in the aftermath of a traumatic event rather than the experience itself that causes the most psychological damage. And if there is no acknowledgement of the damage that has been done, no moral consequences for those responsible, it's as if the trauma never happened. How can we ever reestablish trust in the very institutions, can you say the United Nations, that let things get this bad? 
how do we live with the knowledge that the people who are meant to keep us safe are the very ones allowing the criminal destruction of our planet to continue. I'm wondering if this woman is going to have a job at the UN uh, after, this gets, uh, after this gets out. Perhaps part of the answer lies in T.S. Eliot's observation that, quote, humankind cannot bear very much reality to close quote, to, to shy away from difficult emotions is a very natural part of the human condition. We are afraid to have the tough conversations that connect us with the darker shades of human emotion. We are often reluctant to give voice to the painful feelings that accompany a serious loss like the one we all experienced this summer. We quickly skirt around complex emotions, landing on the safer ground of practical solutions like renewable energy, yes, or taking personal action to feel a sense of control in the face of far bleaker realities. As more psychologists begin to engage with the topic of climate change, they are telling us that being willing to acknowledge our personal and collective grief might be the only way out of the mess we are in when we are finally willing to accept feelings of intense grief for ourselves, our planet, our kids, futures. Our kids' futures, yes. We can use the intensity of our emotional response to propel us into action. Yes, I guess what, by having more kids. I'm assuming Giselle, by these comments, is a breeder. I'm going to take a wild guess. This woman is a breeder. Uh, grief is not something to be pushed away. It is a function of the depth of the attachment we feel for something, be it a loved one or the planet. If we don't allow ourselves to grieve, we stop ourselves from emotionally processing the reality of our loss. It prevents us from having to face the need to adapt to a new, unwelcome reality. Unfortunately, <clears throat> we live in a culture where we actively avoid talking about hard realities. Darker parts of our psyche are considered dysfunctional or intolerable. But trying to be relentlessly cheerful or stoic in the face of serious loss just buries more authentic emotions that must eventually come up for air. As scientists, we are often quick to reach for more facts rather than grapple with the complexity of our emotions. We think that the more people know about the impacts of climate change, surely the more they will understand how urgent our collective response needs to be. But as the long history of humanity's inability to respond to the climate crisis and the comments from Book Hermit have shown us processing information purely on an intellectual level simply is not enough. It's something Rachel Carson, the American ecologist and author of Silent Spring, recognized nearly 60 years ago when she wrote, quote, It is not half so important to know as to feel once the emotions have been aroused. A sense of the beautiful, the excitement of the new and unknown, a feeling of sympathy, pity, admiration, or love, 
then we wish for knowledge about the object of our emotional response. Once found, it has lasting meaning, close quote. In other words, there is great power and wisdom in our emotional response to our world until we are prepared to be moved by the profoundly tragic ways we treat our planet and each other, our behavior will never change. On a personal level, I wonder what do I do in the face of this awareness? Should I continue to work my guts out trying to produce new science to help better diagnose what's going on? Do I try to teach a dejected new generation of scientists to help fix the mess humanity has made? How can I reconcile my own sense of despair and exhaustion with the need to stay engaged and be patient with those who don't know any better? Yes. <clears throat> while I hope, while I hope this will be the summer that changes everything, my rational mind understands that governments like ours are willing to sacrifice our planetary life support system to keep the fossil fuel industry alive for another handful of decades. I am afraid that we don't have the heart or the courage to be moved by what we saw during our black summer. Increasingly, I am feeling overwhelmed and unsure about how I can best live my life in the face of the catastrophe that is now upon us. I am anxious about the enormity of the scale of what needs to be done, afraid of what might be waiting in my inbox. Something inside me feels like it has snapped, as if some essential thread of hope has failed, the knowing that sometimes things cannot be saved, that the planet is dying that we could not get it get together in time to save the irreplaceable. It feels as though we have reached the point in human history when all the trees in the global common are finally gone. Our connection to the wisdom of our ancestors lost forever. And then, of course, uh, if, if, if this woman wanted to have any chance of this being uh, published in The Guardian, she had to wrap up after the single, the single most spot-on, brutally honest and accurate assessment uh, of how totally irrevocably doomed we are uh, on this planet. I guess the editors of The Guardian put a gun to this woman's head and said, wrap it up, girl. As a climate scientist at this troubled time in human history, my hope, my hope is that the life force of Earth can hang on, that the personal and collective awakening we need to safeguard our planet arrives before even more is lost. Of course, think about how much has been lost since I started this rant. <clears throat> that our hearts will lead us back to our shared humanity, strengthening our resolve to save ourselves and our imperiled world. Uh, so, other than that hilarious, uh, pathetic, sad little uh, dose of hopium at the end, amen, Sister Joelle Gurgis. Uh, I hope you uh, don't miss that paycheck 
from the United Nations that you are that you probably just lost uh, with that. But good for you. So if uh, you appreciated what uh, Joel had to say to you uh, about how doomed we are, please show uh, her some love and give her a thumbs up to uh, her analysis of the situation. And if you want to subscribe over here to Collapse Chronicles for more of this doom and gloom, uh, please do so. And I really, really do uh, support the three new patrons I have gotten this week. Three new patrons in my uh, Collapse Chronicles Patreon account. I do appreciate the love. And uh, we will see you tomorrow with our ecological meltdown roundup rant from Manga Bay about how this collapsing planet is heading to a brick wall at 67,000 miles an hour less than three weeks before civil war, martial law, and Mad Max erupts. Yes. Are you ready for your dinner? He said, Pop, I was ready for my dinner an hour ago. Is this the longest rant you have ever had on Collapse Chronicles? Yes. Bye, guys.